definition of God means that God can do whatever He wants, whenever He wants, however He wants, and no one can stop Him. And so, you know, I kind of want to just bring the Word in to make sure, you know, like that, that this gets grounded in the Word. So, you know, when we turn to Job, uh, chapter 42, verse 2, it says, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. We also see in Daniel 4, chapter 34 to 35, it says, His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? You know, God doesn't have to answer to anybody. You know, in Isaiah 46, verse 9 through 10, it says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the end. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And also in Ephesians 1 through 11, it says, He works all things according to the counsel of His will. So, what is God's will and what is God's pleasure? What does He like to do? Like, what is it that He, you know? Now, God does everything according to His deep divine wisdom. God never does anything or allows anything to happen randomly or whimsically or meaninglessly without an intimate, infinitely wise purpose. You know, his sovereignty is governed by his grace, his justice, and his mercy. Isaiah 30, uh, verse 18, it says, Therefore the Lord will wait that that he may be gracious to you. Right? So he's gracious. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. So he's merciful. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So this is this is basically the three of the main things that God really is always in play whenever God does something. His grace, his mercy, and his justice. Um, Romans chapter 9 verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. So God's righteousness is also a big part of it. Well, we have to really understand who Jesus is. Um, is Jesus God? Because that's the big important thing is because we want to know the, the very question that, that Pat was wanted me to answer was the sovereignty of Jesus, you know, and that's very specific. And so the Bible says that Jesus is God. The scriptures prove it out that he is. Okay. So John, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We have as, as people, as human beings, trampled on God's glory throughout time from the very beginning. Because God is a God of justice and righteousness, he has to do something about that. He can't just leave that by itself. Someone needs to be punished. This is the reason why Jesus came, because God, in God's infinite wisdom, Jesus was the answer to solve all those, all those things. Because not only did Jesus come down, right, and receive our punishment, right, which is through the justice and righteousness of God, someone had to receive it, so God sent his son Jesus to receive it. But also he, he glorified, Jesus glorified God by showing how gracious and merciful God was. Because then 
we no longer have to receive that judgment. 3 verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Mm -hmm. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. See, like God, you know, have you ever gotten really angry at someone, but like someone that you truly love and you just wish that it never happened? And it's just it's just in your heart, like this this wrath and this anger or something like that over someone that did something to you, but you love them. So like, how do you how do you resolve that in your heart to to you know like if you look at it in that like you wish that it never happened because you just wanted to show them love you know so god had this thing that he had to do because of the justice and righteousness because of all the evil that we've done all the disobedience but he couldn't just destroy every single one of us because of his love his love is infinite his mercy endures forever and so the reason why Jesus had to suffer and die for our sins was so that we, so that God will be glorified in all that he is because he he never changes. And so it's it's just it's just an amazing thing because because there's no one could there's no other god that anyone could make up that's like that. There's none, there's only one. There's one in the Father and the Son, he is one. And, and, and it's such an amazing thing to, to, to really see how, how much he suffered for us. You know? Like, I used to think, like, why? Like, I didn't understand it. Like, why? Like, I read that verse, like, why did it please God? Like, why did God, why was God pleased to do this? Because Jesus settled everything, settled all the accounts in God, the things that God, who he is, right? He couldn't just let it go. He couldn't. He couldn't let go of justice for the things that we did against them. We had to do, but he couldn't also let us go because he loved us. And so Jesus was the answer, and that is the reason why he suffered and died on the cross for us. And that's the, my word. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you much, much, Peter.